Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Turn the volume on this engine down a little bit. So I learned something important today, which is that Microsoft Flight Sim doesn't have uh, its loading music if you start with the propeller spinning on the runway. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, sort of, sort of boring. You know, 360 around uh, the airplane start. Uh, oh. And I already killed the engine. I wonder how I did that. Uh, that's all right. So today we're going to be talking about takeoffs, uh, both normal takeoffs and crosswind takeoffs. Uh, wait, that is how I killed the engine. Oh, wow. Okay, <laughs> that's all right. Um, bring this up to a thousand, and of course, in the real world, we wouldn't just sit right on the runway. But in the sim, um, that'll be all right for us to talk about some of these principles. So, why don't we flip back here, um, I'll run through a couple of my, uh, let me make sure audio sounds okay, yeah, that's not so bad, nice little hum of the engine in the back. So let me run through a couple of uh, hello and welcome type things, so first of all, hello and welcome. This is a live stream of the lessons that you would go through, starting from not knowing how to fly, all the way through passing your uh, private pilot uh, uh, airman certification uh, standards. So meeting the standards that are required by the FAA in order to actually get your license. So um, I will be teaching through all of the lessons for that and I'll pull up what that full, at least through solo, I have mapped out right now um, looks like. Um, and we can talk about, and if you have any questions about what that process looks like or any of the individual lessons, definitely Feel free to post in the Twitch chat, or if you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, you can also message in the Discord. The goal with this stream is to give some background information on the general contents of these lessons, and hopefully if you're a already a pilot, or if you're someone who's interested in learning to fly, hopefully you pick up a couple of useful things here and there. This is not meant to replace a uh, actual CFI working with you one-on-one uh, -on -one in the real world. That sort of back and forth dynamic, working with your own CFI is really important for learning to fly. Uh, your CFI will be able to identify areas where you're doing really well, areas where you need more practice, and be able to work with you to make sure that you're a safe and proficient pilot. Um, although I am a real world CFI and I am pulling from the lessons plans that I would use with a student, um, I'm not your CFI. So you know, if you're interested in learning to fly, which I really hope you are, one of the best things you can do to start is to go and do a demo flight at your local airport. Um, it'll be either with like a flying club or a flight school, or if there's just a CFI at the airport, uh, those are all great ways to get started. And you'll go up and do just a you know, 30 minutes, maybe an hour sort of uh, background flight, just to see if you like the, the actual flying. A couple of other just housekeeping things. The videos are expiring on Twitch as of today, so I now have uh, the last or the first four all uploaded to YouTube. So I can post that in the chat here. Um, but it's youtube.com slash at Jules Altus. Uh, if you want to watch any of the old videos, that's the best place to watch them now. If you are watching any of these and you have any questions that come up during the live stream, definitely post in the Twitch chat. I'll be looking at that uh, periodically, make sure that everyone's following along and there's no questions. Um, or if you just have thoughts or ideas, also totally fine to just be social there. If you're watching this after the fact, in the uh, thank you for being my co-pilot Discord, there is a, a section for questions, feedback, other things like that. So always feel free to post there too. If you want to use the add-ons that I'm using for this flight, there's a exclamation point add-ons command you can use that'll show them. I will mention that I am not using the Palo Alto add-on uh, today. I was using it the past few flights and it's wonderful. Um, part of the reason I'm starting actually on the runway today is I'm not using the Palo Alto add-on. Um, and it, it started me in like a weird way on the airport. I just didn't like any of the, the starting things. So um, we'll talk about why that was when we get to uh, crosswind, but it has to do with that windsock that has been bothering me the last couple flights. Last thing I'll mention is I may have a couple of bugs still here and there that I'm working through. Um, I am cautiously optimistic about the upload quality. If you've watched the last two flights, um, especially towards the end, the quality seems to uh, drop off for some reason. The 
uh, kilobytes upload speed that I'm supposed to be getting just isn't there. Um, my running theory was that it's something to do with the uh, internet of the area of the bay that I live. Um, we've had a lot of storms here lately. The weather you're seeing out of the cockpit is the live weather here. So uh, for an area that gets historically, well, this time of year actually we do get quite a bit of rain. So this is not you know, terribly unusual for uh, January. Um, but storms and, and severe winds like we've been having are, are pretty unusual. Um, we set a record for the most rain we've ever had uh, a couple days back. So my running theory is that the uh, internet infrastructure just isn't uh, functioning at its best. Um, whether or not that's true, I'm not sure. Um, but I'll try to kind of monitor my kilobytes per second, make sure that everything looks good. And if you notice anything um, detrimental, some, making it so that you can't understand the lesson, uh, or if it's just something I should be aware of, definitely feel free to post in the chat. I always appreciate that input. I think that's all I have before we dive in. Typically, I start off with any follow-up from the last flight. Um, I didn't write anything down to follow up on, so hopefully that's uh, hopefully I didn't miss anything. But if you have any questions or th open threads from the last flight, uh, again, feel free to message. So let's dive in here. So in my effort to simplify my setup, I have everything running through my Windows machine now. Uh, iPad is set up a little bit differently. These windows are all set up differently. I think it's all working correctly, uh, but this is sort of a, a first trial run of using this new app to actually do the the iPad display. So, okay. So this is showing us we are on the end of runway 13 at Palo Alto. So that's good. Everything looks good here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about where we are in our lesson plans, and then we'll talk about this specific lesson plan. So we just recently finished talking about uh, power on and power off stalls. Before that, we were doing maneuvering during slow flight. Um, the lesson before that, we actually did the towered airport operations. At the time, I called it uh, airport ground ops. But uh, later, I actually changed this lesson plan a little bit for future students. So all of the content that, um, or pretty much it's the same content, but I restructured it so it flows a little bit better. Um, but we will move on past that because we've already done this one. So today then we're talking about normal crosswind takeoffs and climbs, which will lead us into two lessons from now, flying the traffic pattern. Our next uh, actual lesson that we'll do is ground reference maneuvers. One of the ground reference maneuvers we do is flying a rectangular course, which in practice is basically what we do for flying the traffic pattern. So it's kind of nice to do these ground reference maneuvers first. Um, if uh, you were actually working with me as a CFI and we wanted to jump right into flying the traffic pattern, after this, you would have enough information to be able to start doing that. Uh, but I think it's nice to, to jump into, I'm sorry. Um, uh, oh, if we wanted to jump from four fundamentals of flight directly to ground reference maneuvers, we could have done that. Um, but we're just kind of going, I think this order builds a little bit better. And then once you get to flying the traffic pattern, you'll know the ground reference maneuver and you'll know at least the takeoff part of it. And then we'll start working on uh, go arounds and landings. For today's lesson, let me fold this up real quick. So our objective here is to understand and become proficient at the procedures used for normal takeoffs and climbs. Actually, this is normal and crosswind takeoffs and climbs we're gonna do today. Couple of references that are really handy, the Airman, uh, Airplane Flying Handbook, Chapter 5. Um, this is about maintaining uh, aircraft control, especially when we're doing slow flight at low altitudes. Uh, Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, Aerodynamics of Flight, this is the one we've referenced for slow flight and stalls. And then Chapter 11 here is about aircraft performance, and we'll actually look in the POH today and we'll do some performance calculations. So this starts to be a good reference for those. The Airman Certification Standards, of course, for the private pilot, and the POH, the Pilot's Operating Handbook for the aircraft. This lesson builds on the four fundamentals of flight, maneuvering during slow flight, four fundamentals from especially the climb portion, and maneuvering during slow flight because we'll be flying so slow for takeoff. I currently have us uh, scheduled for a half hour of ground, an hour of flight, and then, of course, every flight going forward, then uh, the student will be doing the takeoffs. So this is a skill that we'll practice every single flight, um, some flights many times. 
I am cautiously optimistic about a half an hour of ground time. I feel like we may need the full hour, but at any rate for the live stream we're currently doing, I'll try to keep it to two hours. So we'll finish about uh, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Check in the chat, make sure we don't have any questions here. All right, looking good. So I will dive into lesson elements. So we're gonna cover a couple of key topics today. We'll start with the theory of takeoffs and climbs and some of the, the background, either aerodynamics or wind factors or things like that that are, you need to be thinking about. We'll take that theory and we'll put it into practice um, with actually the mechanics of doing a takeoff and you'll see how that theory then gets applied. Talk about normal climbs, the procedure for normal climbs, emergency considerations um, for if something happens during the takeoff and climb, and then common errors we finish up every lesson. So let's dive in. All right. So this is one, a topic that I went back and forth between introducing earlier or later. So the FAA required training before you um, can solo doesn't require that we talk about best angle of climb versus best rate of climb. I decided that it's worth putting in this lesson because I think understanding the difference between the two will make further lessons easier to talk about because we can reference it without having, um, having already discussed what those two things mean. They're not super hard, so it's just sort of a nice bit of background. Um, one thing I really didn't like, though, is the FAA manual doesn't have, at least when I was training, I remember a graphic, and I couldn't find that graphic. Um, but I found a close enough graphic, and they just use a term I have never seen anyone actually use um, in practice. So anyway, first thing to talk about is climb speed. So there's two different climb speeds that, that are really important during takeoff. There's best angle of climb and best rate of climb. That's VX and VY. The FAA handbook, this is from chapter 11 of the PHAC, calls it uh, maximum AOC versus maximum ROC. Um, that AOC and ROC, I don't think I've ever seen, I've probably seen it written somewhere else, but I've never, never heard someone refer to it that way. Um, everyone calls it VX or VY. So when you see max angle of climb, that's VX, and max rate of climb is VY. So the difference between these two is the max angle of climb is the airspeed that you fly so that you climb the furthest along the, um, I'm sorry, so you climb at the steepest angle. So you're, make, you're, uh, you're traveling the most distance up for the distance um, along the ground you've moved. So notice that this max angle of climb for every you know, foot, that the plane has moved along the ground, you're then gaining the most altitude you possibly could. So that's that max angle of climb. And so you might use this, for instance, if you're flying and you need to clear some obstacle in the distance, you want to make sure that you've gained the most altitude uh, you could have in the amount of distance you have. So that's that max angle of climb. Max rate of climb then is gaining the most altitude you can per unit of time. So where max angle of climb is gaining the most altitude per unit of distance, max rate of climb is gaining the most altitude per unit of time. So you'll notice in this example, if both of these two planes took off at the exact same moment, the max angle of climb has, uh, I'm sorry, the max rate of climb is actually higher up. So it's gained more altitude in that same amount of time, but it's further along distance wise. And so if you needed to, for instance, clear an obstacle, you would want to use max angle of climb because that's going to get you your most altitude per unit distance. If you just want to get up higher sooner, which is often the case at our airport like Palo Alto, where we don't have um, trees maybe at the end of the runway. In that case, then you want to use your max rate of climb because our goal is to get as much altitude. We want to get as far away from the ground as we can, as quickly as we can. So all of our past lessons, we've been using that VY speed for the Cessna 172 SP, which is 74 knots. And so you've heard me say 74 a number of times when we're doing our climbs and we're, when we're taking out from the, uh, when we're departing from the airport, all those times it's been 74. We haven't really had a need to use VX speed for any of the training we've done so far. 
when we go out to an airport that has either um, trees at the end of it or later on when we start to do practice with short field takeoffs um, where you're trying to cover or you're trying to get off the ground and up in the air using the least amount of distance possible, that's where we start to use VX more. So takeaway for this is for most of the rest of the lessons that we're doing will be focused on VY, that uh, 74 knots. Um, we will reference VX from time to time. Um, even later in this lesson, we'll reference it a little bit. Um, but VY, for the most part, for where, where, where we are flying, we want to get the most altitude in the least amount of time. And since we're more concerned on time, we go with the rate, max rate of climb. OK, a couple more theory elements here. Next one is ground effect. Let me pull up this actually is, is a pretty important concept. So oops. Uh, ground effect is a condition of improved performance encountered when the airplane is operating very close to the ground. Ground effect can be detected and normally occurs up to an altitude equal to one wingspan above the surface. So there's this picture that they have. Um, let's see if I can do this from the FAA, which I think is um, it at least explains kind of what what's going on with the airflow and why you would experience ground effects. So when the airplane's flying low like this, the airflow over the wing impacts the ground right away, and that changes the aerodynamic characteristics of the plane. Essentially, it makes it so the plane performs better than it would if it were higher away from the ground, out of ground effect. And so you get a couple of big effects you'll see. One is that you get um, less thrust required to gain the velocity that you want. So you seem to accelerate faster. Um, you also don't need as much, or I'm sorry, you get more lift for uh, less, yeah, sorry, you get more lift with a, I'm sorry, let me make sure I'm reading this right. You get more lift for a lower angle of attack. So um, in other words, you're generating more lift than you would outside of, of ground effect. So. Okay, so you're able to accelerate faster, you're able to generate more lift, but the problem is as soon as you leave ground effect, um, then neither of these two things apply anymore. And so you suddenly need more angle of attack to generate the same amount of lift than you would have when you were in ground effect. The reason that that's important is when you're taking off from the runway where you're in ground effect and you're in ground effect until you're one wingspan away from the ground, so through the first part of the takeoff, it'll feel as though the airplane is ready to take off uh, or that it could start flying because of that improved performance near the ground. If you um, fall for that, if you um, don't understand what's going on with the ground effect there, you may be tempted to start climbing out from the ground because it seems like the airplane is ready to fly. But as soon as you get away from the ground, then uh, you lose all of those performance improvements from ground effect. Suddenly you need more angle of attack to carry that lift. And you may be at a point where you actually can't, you don't have the power required or the speed required to keep the airplane flying. And then you'll fall back down to the runway. Um, depending on how aggressive you've tried to leave ground effect and what speed you're at, that can be a pretty dramatic stall and then fall to the ground. Or it can be just sort of like a settling down back on the runway. In either case, that means that you've used a lot more runway in your takeoff, um, and and it's uh, ends up being a worse performance for the actual takeoff itself. So you've now used up a bunch of runway that you otherwise wouldn't have had to. The way that we address this to to address in ground effect, I'm sorry, to actually take off in ground effect, is we. Uh, okay, so th this sort of says the same thing I was just saying, which let me see if I can make this a little bigger. So essentially saying that like there's um, decrease in drag, so the airplane performs better. And so it may be able to fly at a lower indicated airspeed than we actually use for rotation for takeoff. Um, and so what they're recommending you do then is accelerate in ground effect to VX or VY. We'll talk about this when we talk about uh, soft field takeoffs. Um, this isn't how we're going to do the actual takeoff, but essentially what they're saying is that because you can use this ground effect to your advantage, you can use that then to accelerate. Um, and then once you get above the ground effect area, then you lose all those aerodynamic advantages. Um, I'm going to actually remove this one because I think this is, oops, I think this is a more confusing graphic than it's worth. 
because that is not how we're going to do our takeoffs here. Um, okay, so the important thing being that you're going to have uh, better performance when you're near the ground, and so you need to be aware of that. What we end up doing in practice then is we fly the speeds that the POH recommends for takeoff. So there's a speed for rotation. That's when we're going to rotate the airplane um, to the attitude we want to climb out at. And then there's the VY speed that we're going to use to actually climb out. And so if we rotate when the POH says to rotate at the speed it says to rotate, and we climb out at the speed the POH says to climb out at, those both account for ground effect. And so we'll be good to go. Where you get into a dangerous situation is if you are trying to rotate before that rotation speed, or if you're trying to climb out sooner, um, neither of those two things will, will work and you'll actually end up um, like I said, once you leave ground effect, you won't have the performance you need, and then you will settle back down to the runway. Next one to talk about here is the effect of wind, density, altitude, uh, weight, and runway surface on takeoff performance. So let's just go through each of these one at a time, and we can kind of talk about, um, think about them in the extreme, and I find that that helps with uh, understanding them just as they change. <clears throat> Excuse me. Grab a little bit of my water here, one sec. Oh, my co-pilot putt left. My uh, two-year-old dog was sitting right next to me for the last couple live streams, but he <laughs> he's decided that he's uh, he's a cooler pup on the couch, so he went and laid over there. That's pretty funny. Okay, so <clears> the <throat> first one we'll talk about is the effect of wind. We know that there's a certain speed that we need to reach in order to take off. If we have a headwind, that means that there's already a certain amount of wind that's like, let's say there's a direct headwind right down the runway. That means there's a certain amount of wind that's already fl flowing over the wings. And so we have that much airspeed essentially already acting on the airplane. So... If we have a strong headwind, it's going to decrease our takeoff roll. It's going to mean that we can take off sooner because we've already, in essence, uh, achieved some of the wind speed that we need. If we had a tailwind, it would be the opposite problem. So if we have a wind coming from behind and we try to accelerate for a takeoff, we first have to overcome the tailwind until we're back to essentially flying at zero knots. And then we have to accelerate beyond that. So it can increase our takeoff roll pretty significantly. That's one of the reasons why we always want to take off into the wind um, with some very specific exceptions. For instance, if you're taking off downhill um, and yeah, actually I'm going to jot that as a thing to look at for, um, for a future lesson, because that's going to complicate things for this discussion. Um, but it is sort of, uh, sort of important. So, but generally we, we take off into the wind because we want that advantage from having some airflow already over the wings. And so part of the reason that I started on the um, runway 13, so I'm, I'm using live weather and we're gonna change the weather here to play with it a little bit more, but you can see actually off in the distance, the windsock, uh, which by the way, the reason that I'm not using that add-on is the windsock was rotated 180 degrees. So for those of you who were there for the earlier lessons where I was sort of looking at it going like, this doesn't match what I'm expecting. Um, sure enough, I, I played around with it and I went to a different airport that didn't have the add on and, and the windsock was the opposite. So anyway, so, but you can tell if we look at this windsock, uh, tell you what, I'm gonna turn off traffic. All right, so if we look at this windsock, you can see that the wind is blowing right down the runway, more or less. Um, and so we are then on runway 1-3 because we want to take off into the wind like that. Kind of a dark day inside the uh, cockpit here. What's going on? I wonder if this is the same thing that it was before. There we are. Okay. Got my key setting correctly. Um, okay, so that's the wind aspect of uh, takeoff considerations. Another one is density altitude. Density altitude is uh, non-standard pressure corrected, or I'm sorry, pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. 
So what that means is if we are in a high pressure system, um, then the setting we would use, actually we are currently in a high pressure system. So I haven't got the latest ATIS for the airport, but right now, um, since this should be at zero, uh, we're probably around 30.06 or seven or something like that. We'll, we'll get the actual um, pressure at the airport when we get our ATIS. Um, with a higher air pressure, there is more density to the air. Hold on, let me think about this correctly. So this should be a, let me make sure this is a low pressure system before I say anything else. Um, so I'm on my iPad here and I can turn on surface analysis. Not as useful as I'd hoped. Okay, we're gonna go to imagery and we'll look at the latest surface analysis. Yeah, it's not quite as useful as I'd hoped. Okay, well, the reason I'm, I'm hesitating is typically a low pressure system is associated with poor weather, uh, which is what we're seeing here. Um, but it, we, it seems like we're in a high pressure system and sure enough, when I look at the map, this H right here tells me that at least down in Southern California, it's a high pressure system. We have a bit of a pressure gradient here, which is probably what's drawing it in. And then also this warm front um, coming towards us is, is probably causing a lot of this sort of weather. Um, I also know there's a bunch of stuff just from watching some of the weather reports. There's a bunch of, um, you see this long pressure gradient up in the top section. Uh, that has to do with, I think, atmospheric rivers going on. I'm not sure if that's still the, the phenomenon that's causing a lot of this. But anyway, okay, so let's go back to, we'll go back to the map. I'm going to turn this off again. Zoom in on Palo Alto. Okay, so at any rate, the um, Density altitude is our pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. And so if we're flying at um, higher altitudes, so like let's say we're flying at uh, 5,000 feet, or if we're taking off from an airport at, say, 5,000 feet, the air at that higher altitude is less dense. If it's a hot day out, if it's warm temperature, then a dish, uh, that, that warm temperature makes the air even more, uh, even less dense. So it's less dense because it's at high altitude and it's less dense because it's warm out. So this is what we talked about. Um, uh, what, did, what was the, I don't want to say this wrong. Um, whoops, four dot. So yesterday when we were looking at this, we talked about, oops, sorry, this would have been two days ago. Hot, high, and heavy. So those three sort of red flags that if you get all three of them, you expect a pretty strong degradation in aircraft performance. It's the same sort of thing we're talking about with density altitude. So if we're, um, oops, Uh, so if we're hot, high, and heavy, um, then our air density is reduced. And if we're heavy, then we um, need more performance in order to do the same sort of takeoff. We'll look at that in just about a second. That's the weight part here. Um, and so at that uh, high density altitude, then we have less air molecules per uh, unit of volume which means that there's less air flowing over the wings. There's less air being pulled through the propeller. Um, and both of those two things then reduce the performance of the aircraft. It also means that it will be, it'll take longer to take off from the runway because it takes longer for the plane to accelerate. Excuse me, it takes longer for the plane to accelerate to the speed that you need to fly. 
The good news is that your airspeed indicator indicates the uh, the air speeds that you should fly don't change even at the higher altitudes. So our, if our rotation speed is 55 knots at a high density altitude, we're still going to rotate at 55 knots. The um, wings and the propeller are going to uh, generate less uh, power. They're not going to perform as well at those high altitudes. Um, but the reading that we get in the uh, pitot tube will also will still indicate correctly with um, when we should be flying the plane. That explanation was kind of kind of jarbled all over the place. Um, let me try to summarize one more time, which is at a high density altitude. So if you're at a high altitude, maybe 5,000 foot airport, or if it's a hot day or both, the air is less dense. Because the air is less dense, there's less air molecules flowing over the wing, less air molecules getting pulled through the propeller. And so that means that you're not generating as much forward thrust from the propeller, and you're not generating as much lift from the wings. Both of those two things mean that you're going to need more runway distance to actually take off from the runway. The good news is that your pitot tube will still correctly measure your airspeed as what the aircraft is currently experiencing. And so if you fly the numbers, the same rotation speed, the same VY, the same VX, um, that is uh, still the correct numbers to use for, for where you are. Um, okay, there's a bit of an asterisk on the VXVY. VXVY actually change as you go up in altitude um, just a little bit, um, but- uh, Oh, geez. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's our uh, alarm dog here going, letting me know that there's a package. I think it just got dropped off. Maybe just a neighbor walking. Hmm. It's a little unusually loud, but anyway, so I will go. Um, uh, he's on a timeout for a minute, so I'll go and, and let him back uh, back in the room in just a second. Sorry about that loud noises. I hope that wasn't deafening in your ear. Um, actually, I'm going to make a note to go back and make sure that that's... Um... Because uh, especially uh, being the single pup parent at home, there is a non-zero chance that sort of thing will happen in the future. So I'll see if there's a way to set like a sound cap or something. Um, so sorry, I got so startled. All right. Um, let's keep going through here. We're talking about density altitude, higher density altitude means that we will see or decreased performance means we'll need a longer takeoff roll. We'll see that in the POH when we look at that. Additional weight means that we need to generate more lift means we'll need a longer takeoff roll. And then the runway surface also impacts our takeoff distance in that if we're taking off over grass, for instance, um, there's going to be more friction against the tires. And so we'll need uh, usually longer to, to take off from it. Um, there's also things like if you're on a slope, so if you're on a hill taking off, a downhill, uphill can also impact it. Next thing to talk about here is the crosswind component of wind. So let me actually grab the scratch pad on here. And what I want to look at with this is talk about how we think about wind direction as far as a headwind or a crosswind and why that matters. So we're going to track this both. Um, normal takeoffs with no crosswind, and then crosswind takeoffs today. So let's say that we have our airplane is sitting on a, so we have a runway, um, the airplane's sitting on the runway, so here's the wings, maybe here's the tail. Oop. Uh, there's the front of the airplane, the little propeller. Okay, so this airplane, if we were taking off in that direction, right, the wind that we're feeling over the airplane as we take off will depend on the direction the wind is currently blowing. So I mentioned right now in Palo Alto, the wind is blowing basically right down the runway. And so we have this wind coming from straight in front of us, blowing right over. And let's say that it's blowing over at 10 knots. 
that means that we're essentially starting our takeoff roll already at 10 knots of airspeed. So we've got this sort of additional advantage that's going to shorten how much runway we need to do. Now let's say instead that we have a, a wind that is coming out of the uh, from our right, and let's say that it's a direct crosswind. So we're looking like this, and this is 10 knots. And so in this case, we aren't uh, there's no headwind that's assisting us, but there is a certain amount of a crosswind that we're going to need to account for in how we do our aileron controls. And so we'll talk about how to do that crosswind takeoff, but essentially we're going to deflect our ailerons uh, towards the wind, into the wind, um, and that'll allow us then to keep the airplane controlled through the takeoff. Um, like I said, we'll get into a little bit more details in a moment on that. What I want to talk about with the crosswind component of wind is when we start to look at winds that come at an angle. So let's say that we have a wind here and it's coming down and it's again it's a 10 knot wind but it's at a, a 30 degree angle to the airplane. So in this case we can break that wind into its two components. So if you remember from your trigonometry classes and if you don't that's also just fine. So we have this wind vector that's going down here. We can break that into the headwind component, this section. Actually, you know what I'm going to do is use a new color. So we can break that into the headwind component, which will be this part, and our crosswind component, which will be this part. And we said that the uh, wind is at a 30 degree angle to us. So if we look at this right here, that is 30 degrees. So if you remember from trigonometry, the way that we find the crosswind component is taking the, I'm sorry, the headwind component would then be the um, cosine of 30 degrees times 10 knots. So that would give you the component of, that would give you this one. And the crosswind would be the sine component or the sine of 30 times 10 knots. All right. Um, I am going to go let this dog back in the room. Let me pull up really quick the crosswind component. So we were talking about how, oops, these things are in the POH to go and reference. So wind components is one of those. So I'll leave this up just to check out um, real quick. And then we'll talk more about that one in a second. So if you're staring at the trigonometry going, I don't like uh, trig and I don't want to deal with that. There is another way to do it. Um, that's what this is all about. So zoom that in. I'll be right back. All right, here we go. So I mentioned that there is one way to do this is to take the sine and cosine of the uh, wind velocity, and that would give you the two different components. So in this case, sine of 30 is 1 half times 10 knots. Oops, let me make sure this is a little more readable. Sine of 30 times 10 knots. Uh, is one half times 10 knots is five knots. So with this wind at a 30 degree angle, we have a five knot crosswind component. The cosine of 30 is, I don't remember actually, um, but let's search that real quick. That's not right. Did I do this wrong? Oh, <laughs> oops, uh, I think I have to use radians. Okay, can I go degrees? Okay, yeah, that's right. I was it, I was doing cosine of 30, but 30 radians, not 30 degrees. So um, anyway, okay, so then that is um, 0.86 times 10 knots, uh, which roughly equals 8.6 knots. So notice that the headwind component is 
just short of 10 knots and the crosswind component is five knots. So it's not, it's not like the sum of these two things adds back up to 10 knots. We get a crosswind component that is uh, pretty sizable, half of it for just 30 degrees. Okay, so there's two more things I wanna show you with this. One is the POH version of this. This is also what you'd see on your knowledge test as one of the graphics. And then the other one is just a rule of thumb to remember what crosswind component it is for however much degrees off the wind is so that you don't have to do the sign uh, each time you want to find out how much it is. So, all right, so let's go back to this crosswind component uh, visual. And so I'll draw on here real quick so we can see what I'm talking about. So in that same case, we had a velocity we were talking about of 10 knots. Um, so the velocity is these arcs here. So that's the wind velocity. So a velocity of 10 knots would put us, so let me make sure. Okay, great. A velocity of 10 knots where the angle between the wind and the uh, direction of the runway is 30. So that's this one puts us right here. And so sure enough at 10 knots, our crosswind component, if we follow this down here, is five and our headwind component is 8.6 ish. So this is another way you could do it. And this lets you get, of course you could use the sine and cosine if you want, that's just fine. Uh, but this lets you get pretty much whatever you want right out of the POH without having to do any kind of specific math. So if you had like, you know, a 40 degree uh, relative to the runway and it's a 30 knot wind, then you could drop down and say, okay, well that's about 19 knots crosswind component, really strong crosswind component. Um, and you can kind of play with that, so. Okay, so that's one more way to do these crosswind components. The other one that I'll mention briefly is you can approximate if it's a 30 degree from the runway heading to the airplane heading, so, or from the wind direction to the airplane, so that would be, um, right, so we're taking off like this, and let's say that the wind is coming at a 30 degree to us, so that would be this one. Okay, that's gonna be about one half um, of the velocity is the crosswind component. So if you, um, oh, I have never used that menu before, cool. Um, so same thing we just did over here on this side is we have, um, right, it was sine of 30 is one half and so if you have 30 degree offset, the crosswind component is one half of the total wind velocity. If it's a 45 degree offset, the crosswind component is about 75% of the total. Um, so in this case, if we had one that was at a 45 degree like this, and let's say that it was a 10 knot wind again, then we'd expect it to be about 7.5 knots. Um, and sure enough, if we go in here, we go 45, we look at uh, 45 at 10 knots here, follow that down to the bottom, and we get 7.5, kind of as we expected. So that's a good rule of thumb. It's 45 degrees off of runway heading. Um, then you expect it to be about 75% of the velocity. If you get to 60, per, uh, 60 degrees or greater, it's essentially 100% of the uh, headwind, of the, of the total wind. So this is feels a little bit counterintuitive. We can look at it on here or you could do the sign on it, but let's say that we have um, a wind velocity at 60 degrees to the runway at 10 here. We can follow this down then, and technically it's about nine, but more or less it's 10. Like once you get uh, 60 degrees or greater, you're more or less dealing with everything being the crosswind component um, for like practical purposes, that's that's a good way to think about it. So again, 30 degrees off from runway heading, if the wind is 30 degrees off from runway heading, then the crosswind component is one half of the wind velocity. 45 degrees is 75% of the wind velocity, and 60 degrees or more, it's 100% of the wind velocity. All right, do a quick time check here. We're doing okay still. So the next thing I wanted to show is, quick check the chat, make sure there's no questions. Okay, looking good. So the next thing to show here is the max demoed crosswind. So the max demoed crosswind is something that you'll find in a POH and 
uh, there's a couple of places you can find it typically. Every POH is a little bit different, although they're supposed to be structured uh, the same. Um, but you'll say, uh, for instance, here it says maximum demonstrated crosswind. I'm reading this, the note down below. Maximum demonstrated crosswind component is 15 knots, not a limitation. The other place that you can find it is, um, I'll just use my, I bookmarked this earlier. At the beginning of section four, this is the normal procedure section, there's a whole set of air speeds here. So if you're someone who likes to fly a lot of sim planes um, and you're like me where you kind of want to know what the right rotation speed is or the right climb out speed, uh, if you can find a copy of the POH, usually they'll have a nice table like this somewhere. Um, it's supposed to be, well, I, I usually look first in section four because that's a pretty reasonable place for it to be. Sometimes it's in a different place. Um, just depends how they decided to do the final POH. Um, but section four is a pretty good start. So see a couple of things in here, but the one I wanted to point out is the maximum demonstrated crosswind velocity. Again, 15 knots, same thing we saw on that other page. The maximum demoed crosswind velocity is when they were um, certifying that the plane is safe to fly in all the ways that the FAA expects them to. They went out, a test pilot went out and demonstrated, actually flew it in a 15 knot crosswind and showed that it could be uh, handled sufficiently and landed just fine. There's a couple of things to really note on there. One is it's not a limitation then. So it's just the speed that either at the test facility that they had, um, uh, or like that, that was the speed of, um, let me say this differently. Um, it's not a limitation. It's just the speed of the crosswind when the test pilot went out and demonstrated that it could exceed or that it could perform up to the FAA standard. So 15 knots was what they used for this. Um, it doesn't mean that it can't land in a crosswind that's greater than 15 knots. Um, it also doesn't mean that you're not allowed to land it in a crosswind that's greater than 15 knots. What it does mean is that when Cessna decided to send a test pilot to prove that it could be landed in a, a strong crosswind, they decided that 15 knots was a good number for a good strong crosswind. So if you're a new pilot first starting to fly, um, or you're gaining some experience with crosswind, I would strongly encourage you to think of 15 knots crosswind as a hard limit. Um, and in fact, when you're first starting to go, when you get endorsed for solo by your instructor, um, almost certainly you're going to set that crosswind limit uh, explicitly in your endorsement to something much lower than that. Um, when we do the crosswind takeoff today, we'll look at doing an eight knot crosswind takeoff. We'll do an, a 15 knot crosswind takeoff. And you can see a little bit of the difference. Um, but, uh, but that max demoed crosswind component is a good reference point as sort of a like thinking about what the uh, reasonable limits of the plane are. Um, just for a couple of other reference points, if you're curious on like bigger planes, like a 757, apparently the max crosswind component, the max demonstrated crosswind component is like 50 something knots. So it's like way up there. A lot of the trainer planes are around 15. Um, that's pretty standard. Um, and there's a certain uh, minimum requirement to the FAA. I can't remember what their minimum is, uh, but that's part of the reason they have to go and demonstrate it with a test pilot. So, okay, so that's the maximum demo crosswind component. Remember, not a limitation, also not um, necessarily the right limitation for you as a new pilot, um, but it is a, a nice reference point from the POH. And our last thing from the POH before we actually go out and fly this is the performance chart. So in uh, the POH under section five, which is all about performance. So that's this section. Um, there's a bunch of, so that's right after the wind components in the Cessna POH. There's a bunch of calculations on the short field takeoff distance. We're going to be doing a normal takeoff procedure. So um, our actual takeoff rule will be a little bit longer. But if you were going to an airport that you haven't landed at before, or if you're um, planning for your alternates, um, or when we start to talk about cross countries, you'll need to do the calculation on how much takeoff distance you need to, to fly the airplane. There's two key numbers. There's the uh, ground roll. So that's how much time your wheels will actually be on the ground. And then there's the total feet to clear a 50 foot obstacle. And often this is the more useful one because if there's, for instance, trees at the end of the runway or a building or something like that, um, you want to make sure that you have enough space to get to 50 feet above the ground. Um, not just that you have enough space to get the wheels off the ground because that doesn't actually clear you of the obstacle. 
So let me clear all these real quick. Okay, so the other thing that I'll point out is we talked about how the uh, effect of wind, density, altitude, uh, we talked about the effect of wind. First of all, we'll just go one by one on here. So if you notice on here, on notes three, it says decrease takeoff distances 10% for each nine knots of headwind. And then for uh, operations and tailwinds up to 10 knots, increase distances for 10% uh, for every two knots of headwind. So that's one bit. We talked about density altitude. So you'll notice that the pressure altitude in feet, remember density altitude is pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. So they have along the uh, axis here, they have the pressure altitude, and then along this axis, they have the temperature. So between the two of these, we get our density altitude. Um, and so you'll notice that as temperature increases, the ground roll increases, or as pressure altitude increases, the ground roll increases. And so if we start to get um, high, hot, and heavy down here, you'll see that the, temp or the ground roll increases pretty dramatically pretty quickly. All right, clear all of these again. So uh, we talked about weight. So you also notice that the uh, short field takeoff distance, they have multiple tables depending on the weight that you're flying at. So up here it says at 2,550 pounds, our max gross weight. If we were uh, lighter than that, you'll notice that the if we just look at the top left corner as a reference point, so 860 here, 745 here. Um, and then down to 2,200, 610 feet. So the less weight we have, the faster we can, or the less ground roll we need to take off. And then last but not least, uh, we talked about the runway surface mattering. So again, you see for operation on dry grass runway, increased distances by 15% of the ground roll. All right, so if we look for today, at Palo Alto, and we'll use the actual weather actually at Palo Alto because it's a little more interesting than, um, oops, they don't have it. Okay, this will be cool. Uh, so in the real world, we have a ATIS and METAR. We have the weather for Palo Alto local. In the sim, they don't, but we can use the weather at a nearby field just for reference. So um, I'm gonna flip back to the sim and let's look at what the weather is today here. So we have, um, this is the date, the 11th, time 1915 uh, Zulu. Um, the wind 140 at 14. So uh, we have, I'm gonna start jotting this down on the scratch pad. So we have 140 at 14. Okay. Seven statute miles visibility. Um, there's a different conversation we would have about if this is actually whether we want to go flying in. Um, we're going to ignore that for today because we're going to change the weather up to clear skies in just a moment anyway. But for the um, conversation here, we can look at some of these. So. Uh, seven statute miles of visibility. We have few clouds at 2,700, few clouds at 3,300, overcast at 6,000. This first number here is our temperature, so that's 13 degrees Celsius. And then our dew point is 10 degrees Celsius. And then our um, uh, pressure is uh, 30.06. Okay, great. So let's flip back to our iPad and start to interpret some of those numbers. So one thing that we know is we have a certain amount of headwind and a certain amount of crosswind. So right now we are facing on runway. Um, the airplane is facing on runway. So I'm going to draw a very simple airplane. And it's facing on runway 13. Our wind is coming from 14. This is 140. And so we have a 10 degree um, offset between the runway heading and the, the wind heading. So let's go and look in our wind component table here. So again, if we say, okay, so we're at 10 degrees off, it's a, what was it, a 14 knot wind? Yep, so that's 14 knot wind. So 10 degrees off and a 14 knot wind is here. And so follow this down. And so our crosswind component is 2.5 knots. That's pretty good. 
Um, and then our headwind component is about 13 knots. So uh, honestly, it's basically 14 knots, um, which sort of makes sense. We're at a very, very slight angle. Um, and so the fact that our uh, headwind and crosswind are so similar, I'm our, sorry, our headwind and the full velocity are so similar sort of makes sense. Um, so we're dealing with a 2.5 knot crosswind and a uh, 14 knot headwind. Okay, so that's one part of it. To then calculate our ground roll, we need to know our weight. So I've loaded the airplane so that we're at 2,200 pounds. So um, uh, one of the lighter weights we can use. One thing I'll mention just while I'm thinking of it, because weight impacts ground roll and also impacts your uh, climb speed, I'm sorry, your climb uh, gradient and performance, the first time a student flies without their instructor, the first time you do the solo, one of the comments that uh, instructors often hear is that the plane feels like it just performs better. So you take off a little uh, shorter on the runway, you fly out um, uh, faster, you climb faster, you'll maybe get to the pattern altitude faster. Um, all that's expected. That's how the performance changes with weight. But for a student who's only ever flown with the instructor in the other seat, it'll be the first time that you kind of feel all of these things be a little bit different. Um, not a big deal. And, and as long as you're flying the numbers, right, you want to use your rotation speed correctly. You want to use your VY correctly. Um, then it, it all works out just fine. Um, but it's sort of good to be aware so you're not caught off guard in your first solo. Okay, so... Uh, we'll calculate the short field takeoff distance because we're not going to use a short field takeoff um, procedure, which is noted in short here, but uh, we'll, we'll do a full lesson on that later on. Uh, because we're not using a short field takeoff distance, we won't get this good of a, a performance out of the takeoff, but it gives us, if we were planning, at least we would be able to decide using our best takeoff technique, what would be a reasonable um, ground roll to expect. We'll also talk about when we do cross-country planning, putting a margin of error on these. For instance, for me, I want the runway to be whatever I calculate the distance over a 50-foot obstacle, I want the runway to have an additional 50% uh, on top of that. So if I calculated that it's, um, let's use a really easy number. Uh, let's say that uh, we calculate this out and we say that it's 2,000 feet we're going to need for the takeoff to clear a 50-foot obstacle. For me, I want a 3,000 foot runway. I want to have an additional 50% on top of the minimum that I would need for this, um, just as an additional margin of safety. Um, if I was going to try and do a runway takeoff where I am using, like I am exactly, you know, 2,035 foot before I hit a 50 foot obstacle, that's pretty aggressive. I would consider it pretty silly because like let's say the wind is slightly different than you expect or the atmosphere or temperature is slightly different than you expect or like something goes wrong or a couple of little things add up, um, suddenly you're too low and you could be running into trees. Um, so I, I, I like to have a nice 50% uh, margin on top of what the uh, calculated roll is, but, um, but that's something we could talk about with personal minimums. Okay, so again, let's go back to our scratch pad. We know that we have... Um, 14 knots of headwind. So if we go and look in here, this is saying decrease takeoff distances 10% for every night. Oh, well, let's, let's do the notes actually afterwards. Let's find our, our base first. So pressure altitude in feet. To get the pressure altitude, we go back to the plane. So pressure altitude is the what the altimeter reads at 2992. So 2992 is our standard pressure. So currently we're below zero, we're about 100 foot below zero. Um, we'll treat it as zero for the sake of this, that would be sea level. Um, if you remember our pressure, our, excuse me, uh, altimeter setting should be 3006. So that was what we got from the ATIS. Okay, so for pressure altitude, we're gonna say that we're at a sea level, if we were at a runway that was at maybe 5,000 feet, this is where we would start to get those higher altitudes. Um, our temperature outside was 13 degrees Celsius. So we have, uh, we'll have to interpolate between these two. And for today we'll use just um, 
uh, a rough estimation on it. When we do calculations for um, our cross countries, we will interpolate uh, properly, meaning that we're going to uh, add up these numbers and, and find the distance between on the charts um, so that we're getting as close to what the actual uh, POH number would be. Uh, but we're more or less between uh, 10 and uh, 20. So I'm going to round up to 15 degrees Celsius, which would give us a little bit of a margin above it. Um, and then I want to know my takeoff roll, my ground roll, these two, and I want to know my over 50 feet. Um, oops. Because we're saying that uh, we're going to use as though it was 15 degrees Celsius, a little hotter than it actually is. We then take uh, halfway between these two. So it would be um, uh, 1,130 plus 1,205 divided by 0.5. So if I go in, I forgot this doesn't have a calculator, does it? Um, let me do that. So I'm just going to pull up the, uh, <laughs> there's a, streamer that I watch that I like who says Matthew later. So I'm just typing this into Google. So I'm doing 1,130 plus 1,205 uh, 1, divided by two, 1,176. So our takeoff roll over, uh, over a ground roll, sorry, total feet to clear a 50 foot obstacle is 1,167.5. And then between these two, so our ground roll is going to be, um, it looks like there's 50 between, so add 25 to 650 is 680. Okay, so our total to clear uh, 50 feet, 1,167.5, and then 680 for our ground roll. There's a couple other things that we need to do. So if we look down in the notes section, Decreased distance is 10 degrees for every nine knots of headwind. So we have 14 knots of headwind divided by uh, nine times the amount that we decrease it for every knot of headwind. So that's gonna mean that we should be decreasing this. Go to the math later again. 14 divided by nine is 1.5555 and then times Point one is 15.5%. So we want to decrease it by 15.5%. So I'm going to do that for 68. So that's 68 minus or 680. So 680 times 0.15 equals. Five hundred and seventy. So you can see that in seven hundred seventy four point six, you can see that in having this headwind, we've now reduced our takeoff roll by a hundred feet. So headwind can have a pretty big impact on that sort of thing. Um, we do the same sort of calculation for our to clear fifty foot objects, which I'm not going to do, um, just to save some time. But we could. And then again, if we were on a grass runway, we would increase the distances um, as well. So. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful. That's how you would do the performance calculations in the POH. Uh, the runway we're working with at Palo Alto, we can go and look and see is 2,400 feet. Um, so we have, and I'm seeing that just uh, on here. There's a couple other places we can look for that number, but that's one of them. Um, so we're well over what I'd like for my safety margin on this you know, 1,176. Um, uh, and and yeah, so so that gives us a sense. It also gives us a sense of where on the runway we should be taking off. So like, you know, we expect a ground roll today of about 570 feet. Um, if we look at the actual diagram, 570 feet would be like here, and so we should really be taking off um, pretty pretty soon after our um, after we start rolling, um, just because we have that nice headwind today. Okay, uh, we're coming up on. 12.05, got about 55 minutes left. Let's get into the actual flying part. So next we're gonna to go to 
uh, actually practice some of these things. First thing I want to point out is the procedure is in the POH. If you go to section four, the normal procedures, I forgot this one doesn't have that. So if you go to section four here, normal procedures, this is also where we saw our, um, well, one, it starts off with those airspeeds. It's where we saw our pre-flight inspection checklist. Um, and then later on, it'll have the normal takeoff uh, checklist. So um, we'll follow this. When I show the uh, screen, you'll see all basically the same thing, but um, I typically recommend using flaps 10, and I'll recommend that to you as well. We'll follow th throttle full open, mixture rich, uh, elevator control. We're going to rotate at 55 knots, and then we're going to climb out. They say 70 to 80. I'm going to say VY, which is 74. Um, and then once we get 200 feet above the ground, we'll retract our wings. This is the short field takeoff procedure, so we'll talk more about that later, um, but that's what that's about. Um, if you want to see the amplified procedures, they have the short versions that we just looked at, but you can also see um, they go into detail for the takeoff. So what the power check should be, wing flap settings, crosswind takeoff, that sort of thing. So there's more to look at in the POH. Um, the homework for today is about reading the POH. Um, so there'll be a little bit more discussion there. All right, pre-takeoff checks, uh, traffic checks. So before we take off, we want to do our normal run-up procedure. We're starting sort of in the middle, just on the runway already today. So we'll uh, kind of breeze over that, but that would be something we do every time we go flying. And then traffic checks, before we pull out onto the runway to take off, we're scanning for traffic in all the places it could be for the traffic pattern. So because Palo Alto operates both left and right traffic, we're kind of scanning all of our quadrants. And we really want to make sure there's not someone who's like about to land on vinyl. With a high wing plane like a 172, as you taxi onto the runway, you kind of need to uh, wiggle back and forth a little bit um, to make sure you can actually see the whole area. So um, yeah, so we'll talk about that. It, it depends a little bit on how the airport's laid out, but that's an important thing to do. Next one here is go, no go location picked out ahead of time. You want to call out, rotate and climb speeds, recite emergency landing options. So let's go each of these one by one. On the actual Palo Alto airport um, in the real world, there is a kind of um, red and white barber pole that marks about the halfway point. So it's like somewhere off in the distance here. Um, on this sim, we don't have that, but we can look at what taxiways are at what thing. So for instance, if I flip back now to the, uh, actually, let me do this. I'm trying to set this up, see if this works. Okay, so if I look at this though, we know that we should be rotated and taken off at about 600 feet. And so we should be off the ground before we get to Charlie, this taxiway here. And so that's off to our right. You can kind of see it in the sim distance here. Um, I'm wary that because I'm not using that add-on that these taxiways may be in the wrong spot, but picking out something like that would be a really good thing to do. Uh, every, every time you take off, you should be identifying where you're going to abort the takeoff if you haven't developed the speed you need. Uh, you don't want to be trying to figure that out on the fly. You want to have a, uh, something picked out on the ground already that's going to tip you off to that. The next one on here, I'll flip back to the iPad, is to call out rotate and climb speed. So you're going to say something like rotate at 55, climb at 74. So that's rotation speed of 55, and then the VY is 74. Um, call those out, one, to practice, because you should be memorizing uh, your V speeds, your rotation speed for sure, as well as your glides, your best glide speed we'll talk about. Um, but you also want to, uh, as you're hitting that stage of flight, to remind yourself that that's the speed you're looking for. The next thing is to recite emergency landing options. So if you are rolling and you haven't developed enough speed by the time, in this case, we'll use Charlie. Typically, you pick something at about halfway. Um, if you haven't developed 70% of your rotation speed, um, so that'll be about 40 knots for us, by the time we get to uh, the halfway point, then you should abort the takeoff. And so as part of your pre-takeoff brief, you'll run through what that would look like. So if I haven't reached... Um, 40 knots by the time I reach Charlie, I'm going to bring the throttle to idle, um, get on the brakes, uh, slow the airplane down and taxi off at the nearest uh, exit ramp or at the end of the runway if I need to. If you have developed enough speed 
so much speed that you can't stop before the end of the runway and you, for instance, lose an engine and you want to recite what you're going to do in that case. So if we had developed enough speed, we're going to take off, we're already in the air, but we're below traffic pattern altitude. Plan to land directly ahead. We'll pitch for best glide of 65. Um, we'll focus on controlling the aircraft and uh, flying it to a landing. A low altitude engine out like that, the most important thing is keeping control of the aircraft and just flying it to the ground. Um, and then if we are at a traffic pattern altitude, then we will turn back to the runway and try and land on the runway at just some reasonable hard surface. The reason we don't want to try and turn back to land on the runway if we're below traffic pattern altitude is doing that 180 degree turn back to the runway with no engine, you lose a lot of altitude really fast. And you actually have to turn not only 180 degrees, but you got to turn like, you know, uh, 245 degrees or whatever to actually get back to the runway and then another 45 to line up with the runway. Um, and in all of those turning, you're deflecting some of your uh, limited lift because you have no engine into your horizontal plane. So as you're right, turning the aircraft back, then it's really hard to uh, like you're gonna you're gonna sink a lot faster than you would otherwise, and so the odds that you actually turn back to the runway below traffic pattern altitude are it's trickier and trickier. Depends on the aircraft, it depends on the pilot, but for our sakes, we'll say if we're below traffic pattern altitude, a thousand feet, then uh, we'll plan to land just straight ahead. Okay, so that's our emergency landing options, takeoff clearances. The couple things that Palo Alto Tower might say: one is hold short, so they might say. Um, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra. You know what I'm going to do actually is put us, uh, that's okay. We, we can just talk about this here. So right now we're waiting, um, on the runway. That's not, uh, actually, let me just do this because this is the right thing to do here. So I'm going to move the aircraft back. You can see sort of, where. Okay, uh, I'm gonna move back here so that I'm off the runway. So let's say that we were in the one three take up or run up area, which is in this sort of section here. Um, and you can see on the map, uh, the aircraft is just right there. And so we'd say something like Palo Alto Tower, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango, India Sierra, run up complete. And then they would respond with one of a couple of things. They'd say either hold short one three, which means hold short of the uh, yellow hold bars. Uh, runway hold uh, markings here, so it's short of that. Or they'd say line up and wait. If they say line up and wait, that would mean that we can move the aircraft. So I'm gonna just taxi myself over here. Oops. Uh, okay, I don't think I broke anything. There we go. So then we would, so hold short, we would wait maybe here. They said line up and wait. That means we are cleared to cross approaching these runway lines. one. Enter but runway we're not one three. To we two thousand four hundred feet might remaining. Be because someone is already taking off, or maybe there's something else going on with the airspace. But that would mean to line up and wait at the end of the runway and just sit here until they tell us more. The last one they might say is cleared for takeoff. If they say uh, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, cleared for takeoff then we would say something back like, we want to always say back what our hold short instructions are. So if they told us to line up and wait, we'd say line up and wait. And they said clear for takeoff, we'd say Cessna, uh, clear for takeoff, 1-3, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango and Sierra. And then we would go and actually just do our takeoff over here. So those are the couple of things that you might hear from ATC. As you cross the threshold to the runway, you want to do a check for traffic and then lights, camera, action, time. Set the controls for crosswind. So we'd have them already because we're taxiing for crosswind. Um, and then we're going to get our feet off the brakes. What that means is if you have rudder pedals beneath you, you'll notice that they're sort of designed so that you uh, can rotate your foot down to apply the brakes. When we're flying, we don't have any use for the brakes. They're only uh, kind of a problem for us. And so we typically drop our heels to the floor so you can only push the rudders in. You can't actually push on the brakes anymore. Um, so I typically recommend as you're crossing that threshold, drop your feet, or drop your heels to the floor so you can only push the rudders. You don't really want to be using brakes um, at pretty much from the point you're taking off, unless you need to abort the takeoff. Obviously, you need to get on the brakes. We'll do a gentle power, a gentle power application, just bring it in over the course of about three seconds. Last scan of the instruments. 
and then we'll dance on the rudder pedals to maintain directional control. Uh, right rudder is necessary to offset the left turning tendency. This is an important um, bit. So I'm gonna cover this just briefly here. Hopefully it doesn't get, um, doesn't get to be too much. I know we haven't actually flown yet today, which is sort of annoying. Um, <laughs> I'm going to update this uh, expected time on each section. I, I said at the beginning, I thought it might take an hour for ground. So I think, I think that's a little better estimate. So there's four left turning tendencies that you'll feel on the aircraft. Essentially what it is, is it's um, elements of how an aircraft works that cause it to twist or rotate around one of the axes. So either it'll cause it to pitch forward, maybe roll about its uh, longitudinal axis or yaw the nose left and right. The effects of each of them vary uh, depending on the flight situation you're in. In one phase of flight, one may be more prominent than the other. In another phase of flight, it kind of flips around. So the four tendencies, I will run through all of these really quickly. The most important thing to know is they all get resolved by proper use of rudder. Um, so it's every single time the answer is proper use of rudder to counteract the left turning tendency. So we'll talk about all four super quickly, just so you should be aware that, of what they all are. But in practice, you're just looking to make sure the ball is centered when you're flying or that you're, you're taxiing or taking off directly down the runway. So torque reaction is about Newton's third law of motion, uh, third law of physics. When the propeller is rotating to the right, the airplane then wants to rotate to the left. When the propeller rotates clockwise, like in the US, then the aircraft itself tries to rotate to the to the left. In flight, this isn't as big a deal because there's uh, another force we'll talk about that counteracts that kind of motion. But when you're on the takeoff roll, you can actually feel additional pressure in the left tire. So it actually forces the left tire into the ground more, creates more friction, and so the airplane wants to pivot to the left. Again, that left turning tendency on the ground. To mitigate that, use right rudder to align with the takeoff roll. Uh, slipstream. This is the rotation of the propeller creates this sort of spiral slipstream here that actually strikes the back tail fin. Um, at high propeller speeds and low forward speed, it's pretty pronounced. Uh, at faster speeds, you don't really see it. The mitigation is use the right rudder. You want to step on the ball to keep the airplane coordinated. When we were doing slow flight and stalls practice, this was a pretty big one we were feeling. Uh, P factor, asymmetric loading. This is an important one for takeoff and it's Kind of hard to explain um, without seeing, so I'm actually going to try and show it. Um, but essentially what this is, to try and explain it in words, is when the aircraft is flying at a high angle of attack, when it's right up relative to the wind, like on the right here, the blade that is moving down takes a bigger bite of the air than the blade that's moving up. And so that causes the blade that's moving down to generate more forward thrust, and that yaws the nose to the left. So um, I'll show you exactly what this means, but when we're flying level, then the wind is moving through evenly through the propellers, and so it generates forward thrust evenly across both of them. When we're at a high angle of attack, though, um, the downward moving blade actually has a higher angle of attack because... Um, a blade essentially works just like a wing on its side. So it's got that same sort of curvature of a wing. The downward moving blade has a higher angle of attack, which means that it generates more forward thrust, generates more lift, just like the wing would. And so that's gonna yaw the nose to the left, whereas the upward moving one doesn't. If you're sort of scratching your head going like, that doesn't make any sense, um, let me try and show it in the sim real quick and see if, if it tracks a little bit more. The reason this one's important for takeoff is at that point, we're gonna have full power and high angle of attack. Um, and so uh, P factor actually becomes a pretty important left turning tendency. Again, the mitigation is just a step on the rudder. So nothing fancy to the remedy, but it's good to understand kind of what's happening because you'll see the same sort of behavior in the air if you're at a high angle of attack, uh, low air speed with high thrust, like if you're recovering from a stall, for instance. Um, and so you want to understand why you need more right rudder at that moment. So you can kind of anticipate that it's going to happen. Hey, Elgo. Hello. It's for propeller only. Um, the P factor is for propeller only. The other left turning tendencies, yeah, the P factor is propeller only. 
if that's what you're asking. Um, the other left turning tendencies, actually, I think they all come from the fact that the propeller's spinning. Yeah, they all come from the fact that the propeller's spinning. That's so interesting. I hadn't really thought about that before. Thanks. Yep, totally. Uh, okay, so let me show you. This is one of the things that my uh, CFI instructor actually showed me, and I'm going to attempt to recreate it in the sim. We'll see how this goes. So I'm actually going to kill the engineer. And let's see if we can um, I'll try and kill the engine at a particular specific angle. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, that'll probably work okay. Okay, so a couple things I'm going to have to do here. I'm going to go into the drone mode and make sure that I can actually, I don't know if you were here for the lesson, I can't remember a couple days ago I had the drone speed was just super, super fast, so I'll go a little slower this time. So remember we showed, uh, I think it was yesterday or maybe during slow flight how the wing has this sort of curvature the uh, vertical I'm sorry the horizontal stabilizer is then that same curvature but flipped upside down so it's actually a wing flying in reverse to generate that downforce we need we got another piece of the aircraft that has that same sort of look and that's the propeller there's a bit of a twist to it we can talk about why that is in a future lesson um, but you see that it has that same essentially what looks like a wing so what I want to show, and I don't know that this angle is going to work. I wish I could grab the propeller and rotate it just a little bit further. Um, I will try Let's see if I can just get it to go. I really want it to be level with the horizon. Oops, it doesn't like how much I've done this. That's OK. Um, I'm going to use the old control E trick. What did I do? Well, uh, I'm afraid I may have played with too many things. Okay, well, I'll attempt to show it as the airplane is, and we'll have to reset anyway. Um, so the P factor is all about the angle of the um, this propeller as one side moves down versus one side moves up while we're climbing. So on, because the propeller rotates clockwise when viewed from the back. And so the one that I'm looking at now is the one that's actually dropping down. And so I want to show you, um, let me see if I can get a better angle here. So, so we're looking at it like this, right? And you can see how there's this, um, it's at an angle. And so that when it cuts through the air, it actually generates that forward lift. If we were at a high angle of attack, and I'm going to simulate that hopefully by literally dropping the tail here by putting just a ton of weight in the, the trunk here. Let's see if I can do that. So if I put in 10,000 pounds, great. OK, that worked wonderfully. <laughs> so this is our high angle of attack flying. And you'll see, let me show you this one first, actually. So oops, uh, let, me, let me do this in the other direction, because I think that'll be more helpful. Drop the payload. So our upward moving um, propeller, when we're flying level, you can see that it's taking this, it has a bit of a curve and it's taking this bite out of the air. Um, and it looks pretty much um, kind of like a wing put on its side here, right? It has this bit of curvature. If we were to take the aircraft and pitch it up at a high angle of attack, so I'll do that same trick I just did. Okay, so now we're flying at a high angle of attack, and you notice that the uh, wing is basically flat to the uh, horizon. And so at this high angle of attack, because it is totally flat, it's not really generating all that much lift. It's like the angle relative to the wind that's moving through it, it's pretty much flat. But if we go down and look at the wing that's going downward, you can see that the angle of the propeller blade is actually really, really steep. And so we have this high angle of attack means it's generating more lift. So to summarize on that, the blade that's moving down has this high angle of attack, generates more forward thrust, generates more lift. 
the blade that's moving up has this low angle of attack, um, generates very little lift, and so generates very little uh, thrust. And so looking at the aircraft from the back, then we would see the nose pitch or uh, yaw to the left. So again, more thrust being generated on the upward moving one than the backward moving one, nose moves left. Okay, so if we go back in the airplane though, again, the solution to this is the uh, to use left or right rudder step on the ball as needed to keep the airplane coordinated. When we're taking off, we'll see the P-factor uh, aspect of it pretty prominently. The last one is gyroscopic precession. In a tailwheel plane, this is a bigger deal, although you do still see it uh, in other planes. This has to do with how a gyroscope works. So if you take a gyroscope and apply a force, maybe you push up on it uh, on this like little rod here. The actual place the force, uh, effectively you're then pushing on the gyroscope here, but the gyroscope, because of gyroscopic precession, is going to feel the force that way and then cause the nose to yaw. So let's look at this in a different aircraft. So if we were in a tailwheel aircraft, we would rotate forward as we're starting to take off to get the tail off the ground. So we've applied a force in the back here, pushing the tail up. When we do that, we've effectively applied a force on the propeller here, but because of gyroscopic precession, the resulting force is going to come off the side of the aircraft and yaw the nose to the left. I'm going to move on from these because um, we'll talk about these more uh, more in the future as we encounter them more. Um, the big thing to take away though is you want to use uh, right rudder, either you're stepping on the ball to stay coordinated or you're using uh, right rudder to keep the airplane aligned with the center line. Generally, that's the solution to these. Um, but yeah, the, the reason behind them, the physics behind them is kind of interesting. So, all right, there's the four left turning tendencies. Let's keep going. All right, let's do an actual normal climb. We'll talk about crosswinds in a second when we get to them. So for the normal climb, we're gonna climb out at VY, 74. Set the trim, correct for wind to maintain the center line if we were doing a crosswind. No turns below 400 feet typically. And then we wanna have awareness, so we don't wanna turn away from the climb until at least 400 feet. Uh, and when we talk about traffic pattern altitudes, we'll talk about our, our more specific altitudes for that. And then awareness of noise abatement rules. For instance, at Palo Alto, we turn 10 degrees to the right for climb out on on runway 31 so we don't do that for this other runway uh, we have talked about emergency considerations already a little bit plans for rejected takeoff reasons you might reject a take takeoff if there's nose wheel shimmy if the engine rpm isn't developing power like it should or if just something doesn't feel right your intuition is a pretty good check of those if it doesn't feel right just abort the takeoff and check out what's going on emergency plans must be in mind before you take off and if you fail on the upwind climb you just want to land straight ahead Okay, let's go fly. So I'm going to restart here. Um, and actually, yeah, we'll restart here and we'll, we'll start from, so I'm going to start with the airplane uh, turned on and going. Um, and so this assumes that we've, oh boy. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, we're gonna have to change the weather a little bit. So that's all right. So let me go into weather here. I'm gonna turn off live weather. We'll go clear skies, but we're gonna give ourselves a little bit of wind. Um, I want it to be right down the runway, so I'm gonna go for um, 130, 130. Uh, we can increase the wind speed here, and we'll just do, uh, we'll do a light, well, actually, let's do uh, like a 10 knot headwind for now. Because remember, if it's a direct headwind, it just makes us fly uh, better. It just shortens our takeoff distance and there's uh, doesn't make it necessarily more complicated. So, all right, so we have 130 direct headwind. Uh, and uh, the wind speed is 11 knots. So let me taxi back. Oops, not taxi back, actually. I want to teleport the aircraft back here as though we just did our run up and we'll run through the whole takeoff. Okay, great. So one thing I want to check here, um, I wish I could see out the airplane. Okay, yeah, good, so I can. So I'm looking at the windsock to make sure that the wind is going the direction I expect because although we have a reported uh, wind, I want to make sure that it actually lines up. So sure enough, the wind's blowing right down the runway, great. 
We've done our whole run-up check, so we're ready to go. Uh, we're going to set our flaps to 10 degrees of flaps, so that's good. Uh, lights, okay, good. So... Nice weather in California, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, a really miserable day out here. Um, this has actually been a really good time to start this live stream, it turns out, because it's been rainy days pretty much every day. Tomorrow's supposed to be a little nicer, which is good. So. Uh, okay, so I'm going to turn off our ADF because we don't need this. And we would have our Palo Alto uh, frequencies array bugged in, so that's kind of nice. Looks like it is. And our uh, ground frequency is probably going to be in our secondary. So after we finish our, uh, actually over here, we might already be on tower. Um, but anyway, we'll just say that we're going to call up tower. So 11,000 RPM. All right, so we'd say something like Palo Alto Tower, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, run up complete. Uh, and then they'd probably say something like uh, uh, taxi two hold short runway one three. And so we'd say, okay, taxi two hold short runway one three. So I'm going to take off my parking brake. Look down my taxiway, make sure there's no one here. Good. Now, one thing before I get going further here, we know that we have wind coming from 140. That's down here. So we have a left quartering tailwind. So I need to rotate my ailerons um, to dive away from the wind and push them forward to get my elevator down. Okay, so let's keep taxiing here. So now as we move to through the wind here to taxi, now the wind is changing. Now we have a direct tailwind, so I'll probably keep the elevator down still just so we don't get caught. Um, uh, yeah, so this is okay. All right, and then taxi up to hold short. So that's what they asked us to do. When we reach the end of our taxi, we bring the power up to 1,000. Um, before we start taxiing, we should set the mixture for taxi, so I'll bring that back a little bit. I'm still holding my uh, ailerons forward. All right, and then while we're waiting, we can scan for traffic just to be looking out for where traffic might be. Um, I wish I could get below my wing a little bit more here. Okay, well, that's okay. Um, so we're looking out to see who else is flying around in the pattern. Eventually, uh, Palo Alto Tower will say something like Cessna Alpha Lima Tango Indy Sierra, uh, line up and wait one three. And then we'd say line up and wait one three. Okay, so again, let me correct here. So getting off my brakes, we're gonna let the airplane start to come forward here. Here we go, we wanna stay on the yellow line. And as I rotate, as I turn through the wind, then I need to be doing my wind Approaching corrections. Approaching runway so one three. Quartering tailwind, so I'm pushing forward. Entered runway one three. And as I'm coming through here, I'm scanning seat scanning remaining. the traffic. And the way that we do this in a high wing plane, oops, I'm going a little fast. The way that we do this in the high wing plane is sort of this uh, S turns through. So I'm actually turning the airplane back and forth a little bit so that I can actually get a better uh, sight picture on who all is out there. Okay, good. Um, and then he said to line up and wait. So we're just going to get to the end of the runway and line up along the center line here. Okay, and mindful of our wind, which is now a direct headwind, so we can keep our ailerons just centered. Okay, good. So now we have lined up and wait as expected. I have to remind myself that with my um, pulled out view here, so um, when I'm zoomed in more like this, the world seems to move past at the normal speed. But when I'm zoomed out like this, the world moves past. It looks like it moves really fast. Just something about the, the distorted view. So I have to remind myself that it's going to seem like we're moving really fast, even though we're not. And the important thing, especially for high density altitude type flights, is we're flying to the correct rotation speed anyway. All right, so we're waiting here. He's going to say something like um, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, cleared takeoff runway 13. So, okay, so we're going to take off here. And I'll say cleared takeoff 13, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra. So we're bringing in, oops, oh, I forgot something uh, important. So we're going to go back because this is not the right way to do this so as soon as he told us as soon as he gave us a direction to cross this yellow line we want to do lights camera action 
So lights means we go down here and turn on our correct lights. So these are all on already. Okay, good. Lights camera is our um, our transponder. So we have it set to 120.0 and it's already altitude reporting mode. Good. And then action is bring our mixture in. Our flap should be set to 10 and our trim should be set correctly for takeoff. So we go one, uh, one, two, three like that to look at those three. Okay, so lights, camera, action. The last one is time. Um, this is really important for instrument flying, but it's a good habit to get into. So I'll call out the current time is uh, 1235. Approaching now, runway here. Again, 13. I'm doing my kind of wiggle thing. I want to get some Entered stability. runway 13, 2400 uh, feet remaining. Let's see, make sure there's no one else in the traffic pattern, especially at non-towered airports uh, where um, you know someone might be coming in with no radio or something like that. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, and then I want to use as much of this runway as I can, so I'm going to go here and then taxi around to the center line. Good. All right, so he said line up and wait. Now he says Alpha Lima, Tango India Sierra. So line up and wait. Good. Alpha Lima, Tango India Sierra, cleared takeoff runway 13. So I say Alpha Lima, Tango India Sierra, cleared takeoff 13. Again, I'm going to bring in full power 1, 2, 3 to bring in full power. As the airplane starts to move, I'm using right rudder to keep it centered. And I'm needing actually quite a bit of right rudder, which is um, expected and kind of interesting to see in the set too. And I'm waiting, I'm looking at my airspeed as alive. And I'm making sure, okay, so we're coming up on our, uh, good, 55, rotate at 55. And then I pitch up for uh, 74. So I'm actually flying, oops, my sight picture again on the takeoff here. So once I get to 200 feet AGL and 74 knots, then I'm going to, so there's 200 AGL and I'm at 74, so I'm going to bring my flaps up. And then continue holding my correct sight picture for 74 and climb out here on departure. And then we would start into either our departure or our traffic pattern, which we are not going to One other thing I want to point out here, so we're flying out away. We should be flying out aligned with the center line. So let me show you what that looks like here. So okay, so I'm climbing out, and if I look behind me, I can actually from the airplane I can look like you can look out the back windows actually and check. Um, but also, so you can see there's the runway three one. Just um, I also might have it on my. So I have extended center line set, and so what that's telling me is that um, you can see my aircraft is actually directly along that center line, which is great. That's where it should be. So on takeoff, we want to stay aligned with the center line until we are actively turning off of the center line, unless we are doing something for noise abatement, which actually the other runway does have that. So. Okay, so then we continue climbing like this, uh, and that's that's sort of it. So. One thing I didn't do that is a good habit to do, especially for aligning with the center line, is setting your heading bug to the runway that you're taking off. One, this makes sure that you're not taking off the wrong runway by accident, um, but also then when you're flying out, you can use it as a reference to make sure that you're still pointed in the correct direction. So there's runway 13, so I'm a little bit to the left, um, which actually does match what I'm seeing in the iPad. Okay, let's restart here. Um, let's just go back to the runway so yeah let's just do that okay this is one of those dramatic Short differences final runway three one doing lessons in sim versus doing lessons in the real world we can just do sync rate uh, sync rate we're doing this as a real lesson then there would be an aspect of going around the traffic pattern every time and you know what's a good use of time for the student so I would teach the takeoffs early, but then we'd probably go out and do more um, practices of some of the uh, slow flight and stalls and things like that. Um, maybe come back to another takeoff. Uh, and you could see a couple of landings, but since we can just do them like this, we will. Okay, so uh, same sort of thing. So we'll go, you know, um, I'm actually going to move us just right to the runway here. So we'll say, uh, let's assume that we were given the instruction to line up and wait, sitting here on the runway. And 
Uh, so we've done our lights, camera, action, time again. We're, all, we're going through. Um, now we're going to do the takeoff, but with wind correction going on. So we did our normal takeoff roll. Um, for wind correction, let me flip back to this. So crosswind takeoffs use a lot of the same principles we had with taxing. So you remember that we were deflecting our ailerons to keep our wing from lifting or to keep our tail from getting pushed or that sort of thing. So with crosswind takeoffs, it's similar, a little bit different, um, and we'll look at how that is. So uh, oh, I got to go into edit mode. So essentially for crosswind takeoff, you're going to transition from a side slip to a wings level crab um, for the climb out. Those are two new concepts. So we'll talk about both of them real quick. A side slip looks like this. So the wind is coming at us from an angle and we've actually uh, deflected the plane to the right a little bit so that we take off the left wing, the downwind wing is going to lift off the ground first as well as that uh, wheel, but the right uh, wheel is going to stay on the ground. In order to do this, we have a little bit of uh, aileron deflection. So for instance, in this picture, you can see that the right aileron is up, so the ailerons are deflected to the right. Um, and we need to use our rudder to stay coordinated. So you can actually see in there no correction versus correction. There's no rudder deflection here, but in this case, they're using a lot of right rudder to keep yourself aligned with the center line. Again, right rudder to keep yourself aligned with the center line. So if we didn't do this proper correction, you end up where the wind is probably going to get under your upwind wing, and it's probably going to blow you onto your downwind tire, and then you get in a pretty unstable position um, where the aircraft's kind of bouncing around. Once we actually take off, so we'll do this, and we'll do this through the whole takeoff. So you're staying, you accelerate like normal. I'll show you how to position the controls as we're actually accelerating. Uh, as we accelerate, we'll take off. We'll be on one wheel um, as we're coming up to rotation speed. When we get a little beyond rotation speed, so we'll actually delay it just uh, maybe a knot or two above that, so maybe 58 or so, maybe 60. Um, then we'll rotate back just like we did before, and then we're going to settle into a crab right away. So you notice that in this, we're taking off directly down the center line. We want to be aligned with the center line for the takeoff. As soon as we get airborne, then we'll crab. And so what that means is we're actually going to fly the airplane at an angle. Crabbing into the wind means that some of our forward motion is being used to counteract the effect of the wind here. Um, we'll talk more about this with ground maneuvers. This is a huge part of it, but for uh, takeoffs, the thing to know is after we get out of the side slip, we're going to transition into a crab. During takeoff, no engine power can be used. Right. Uh, sorry, Elgo, I don't quite understand the question. What do you mean? Because uh, we'll use full engine power for the takeoff. Um, to try and, because we want to accelerate as quick as we can, and we want to get to an altitude as quick as we can. Uh, maybe if you can ask it a different way, I might I might be able to help. Yes, that's my point. No, I don't I don't quite follow. Um, oh, that. Um, no, I don't quite follow. If you don't mind, maybe re-asking the question a different way, I, I'd, I'd be happy to answer. Um, okay, so I'm going to demonstrate this in just a second. But essentially, what it is is we'll take off in the side slip where we're using rudder and ailerons to lift off the downwind leg first and then stay aligned with the center line. Once we get airborne, then we're going to transition into a side slip, or crab, excuse me, which means that we're flying level, but we're actually flying with our nose pointed into the wind some to keep aligned with the center line. Remember, we want to stay aligned with the center line. You flip your nose because you can't during takeoff because you're already full power. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying that there is no additional power available to you because you are already using full power to do the takeoff. Yeah, that's right. So um, so because we're going to have full power in to do the takeoff roll, then um, yeah, all, all of the things that we do during takeoff um, account for the fact that you're going to be using full power. Yeah, okay, cool. Totally got it. All right, so let's flip back then. Hey, no worries. Not a problem. Uh, thanks for the question too. I appreciate it. My, my philosophy on questions is if 
you're curious about something, there's a good chance that someone else is probably curious about the same thing. Um, so I always appreciate him. Uh, and no worries on, on language stuff. Uh, we got there in the end. All right, so I'm gonna flip back to the flight sim here and I'm gonna demonstrate the crosswind side slip takeoff. And I'm gonna try and pause it as we go through so you can kind of see the different aspects of what's going on. Um, I will say in a real airplane where you actually have the weight of the airplane, some of these things are a little easier to feel correctly. So apologies if I'm sort of bouncing all over. I'll, I'll try my best to at least keep it stabilized. So, okay, um, first thing I need to do is change my wind around. So right now we have a direct um, uh, 131, which is fine, essentially a direct headwind. I'm gonna make this so we're off by, uh, let's go eight knot crosswind. So we know that 30 degrees off from our runway heading would be uh, would mean that the crosswind component is one half of the wind speed. So if I set it to 160, and okay, if I set it to 160 and 16 knots, then we know that the, okay, did I, did I type in something? Oh, <laughs> I was like, I can't believe the aircraft is bouncing around that much. Okay, great. So there's 16 knots and one, 160. And so if we look at, um, we can use our heading, uh, indicator as a reference, but 160 is from this direction, so we have a quartering uh, headwind, and it's 16 knots, so we know that we have um, at 30 degrees, that's mostly, it's going to be like 15 knots headwind, which is fine, but the important part is our crosswind, which is going to be 8 knots of crosswind. So just like when we're taxiing, we want to deflect our ailerons fully to the right, and essentially what we'll do as we start to accelerate is we're going to slowly um, feel out how much aileron pressure we need to correctly um, establish the side slip. Remember, because we want to have our nose pointed right down the runway as we're taking off. Um, and so that means that we need sort of the right balance of aileron to deflect into the wind based on the wind speed that's actually coming. So we'll start with full ailerons as we accelerate, then we'll start to bring this back. Again, we're going to need right rudder, and we're hoping to see that we take off uh, with one wheel first. So let me demonstrate this first and see how it goes. So bringing in power over the course of about three seconds. Why am I paused? Uh, let's see, maybe I have back and pause on. Oh, yep, I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, all right, let's abort that takeoff real quick. So power to idle, getting on the brakes. We'll start to try and stay aligned with the center line as we brake here. Okay, good. And then... I'm gonna zip us back to the beginning of the runway. Oh, that's pretty funny. So, okay, great. So we're aligned with one three. Again, we have our uh, 30 degree knot wind off to the right. And we'll do the same thing. So we've done lights, camera, action already. We're ready to take off. Feet are on the, heels are on the ground. And I'm bringing in power. One, two, three, four, starting to accelerate using rudder to keep myself aligned with the center line. Oops. And because I have a crosswind, I'm gonna have my right aileron deflected. I'm starting to reduce that as I'm feeling out where the wind is for strength. Good, there's my lift, my left wheel is lifted off and at rotation speed, then I pop up like that. As soon as I pop up, then I wanna set into a crab. So I'm actually uh, turning my nose just off to the right a little bit. Um, so I'm staying aligned with the center line as much as I can. Um, and doing that once we establish it by uh, going up into, by turning into the wind and then flying this level. Um, and then the rest of the takeoff is the same. I want to be at 74 knots VY for climb out, 200 uh, feet AGL, then we'll bring in flaps, or we'll, sorry, bring our flaps up, and then we'll continue climbing out. Okay, let's do that again. I'm going to try and fly it this time from the view behind, so you can see the actual wheel as it picks off. Uh, I'm also going to increase the, well, I'm going to leave the crosswind points actually. Eight knots crosswind is a pretty, pretty good crosswind. That should be just fine if you're down the straight. Okay, so this time I'm going from the reverse view. I'll bring it a little bit lower so you can kind of see what's happening here. So again, remember we have, if you look at the windsock, we got a bit of our crosswind here. So I will, let me align my Okay, and so let's see, make sure I'm not actively paused. Okay, good. So I'm bringing in my power, one, two, three, four. Okay, starting to roll here. 
and I have my ailerons deflected, so my right aileron is deflected up. And as I'm gaining airspeed here, then I'm trying to feel out what the oh this is really hard to do. Sorry, I'm trying to feel out what the proper amount of aileron she uses until I get to one. Okay, <laughs> well that's not great. So I settle back onto the runway. Uh, let's try that again. So, if I uh, apologies for the, the weird. I know there's actually a plugin you can use that'll let you um, fly it and then just replay it. And maybe I'm gonna make a note that maybe that's something to look into. I don't know how hard it is to set that up, but uh, but that may be a worthwhile investment. Uh, okay, so again, here we are going for the takeoff. I'll try to do. Oh, good, I'll go. I'm glad. I'm glad that's useful. Uh, yeah, some of these ones, especially, I was finding myself getting bit really bad with uh, gyroscopic precession on the uh, Mustangs. I was flying those Mustangs, and they have those super powerful engines, which means that the propeller is spinning really fast. Uh, well, not, yeah, but it just generating like a ton of power, especially when you first take off. And I would just shoot to the left. I mean, my nose, I, just immediately I would turn left. And I was realizing later um, that as uh, as I was rotating the, the tail up, the gyroscopic procession would just pull me over. Uh, I wasn't catching it. So. Anyway, yes, especially with more powerful planes, a lot of these things get more pronounced. Um, okay, anyway, so let me try this again. I'll try and do it from the, the backside again so you can see hopefully at least that... Um, first demo kind of made sense how I was using ailerons pitched to the right um, into the into the crosswind and then how I pop up onto one uh, wheel to start so again bringing in power over the course of four seconds staying aligned with the center line okay. and then I'm feeling out where that wind is so I'm slowly letting back on my aileron watching my airspeed airspeed's alive should be aligned with the center line there you go I can feel that I've got enough control there's one wheels off the ground pop up and immediately I establish that crap and I shouldn't have um, I bounced around quite so much but you notice that I'm flying at sort of an angle to the running and that's the crap so I'm still aligned with the center line but I'm my nose is angled a little bit um, and then again I want to get to 74 knots so uh, I, this should all be sight picture stuff so it's much easier from the actual cockpit where you can see what you're supposed to be seeing uh, but there you go. Okay. So let's do that one more time. And this time what I want to do is go for a more aggressive crosswind takeoff. And I'll try and do everything super exaggerated so you can kind of see more of what it looks like. Um, remember that max demo on this is 15 knots crosswind. So um, doing a 15 knot crosswind takeoff would be a good bit. So I'm going to do, if you remember that 60 degrees off of the runway heading is essentially a full crosswind at that point. So if I go 190, that's 60 degrees off. Uh, and then I'm going to bring the speed to 50. So we're, essentially we have 100% uh, of our wind is coming at a crosswind. And we're at 15 knots of crosswind. So this is us doing a uh, max demo crosswind takeoff. So I'll do it first from the cockpit. And try my best to actually fly through the full procedure. All right, so for someone to bring 10 degrees of flaps, that's what I prefer for takeoff. Actually, for crosswind, you're supposed to use the least amount of flaps that you need. So I will double check. Actually, I was just reading about this in the POH. Yeah, minimum flap necessary for the field length is what they recommend in the POH. So we'll use no flaps for this crosswind takeoff. Um, and then we've done lights, camera, action, and cleared for takeoff. So one, two, three, four. Ailerons are deflected into the wind. Again, I'm trying to feel out how much deflection I'll need to get the nose up. Okay, or to, sorry, to roll onto my right wheel just slightly because I want to get that side slip set. Airspeed's alive, coming up to 50, at 55 I'll rotate, there's 55, rotate off the air, and then I crab on takeoff here to stay aligned with center line. So should be a little bit more left, looking for 74, good job. Right, that was less, well you can see now how much of a crab angle I have, but um, less dramatic than I expected actually. All right, 
got about five more minutes left, so I'm going to try and do that same thing. Again, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, right wind now that we're dealing Approaching with. Approaching runway one three. And I'll try and do that same thing viewed from behind so you can see. Uh, again, apologies for the uh, jumping around. I'm sure there will be some amount of that. Yeah, but I'll do my best. Okay, so again, we're expecting, because we have a wind coming from the right, we're expecting our left wing to come up first if we're doing it properly, so we should have just our right wheel touching the ground when we take off. So one, two, three, four, bringing in full power, getting aligned with the center line, and I should have my aileron deflection going. I'm trying to feel out how much I need to side slip correctly as we take off. Coming up to 50, there's 55, so we'll rotate off. You notice how I popped up on the one wheel and then established the ground. 74, then we start to climb out at 74. Remember, we want to be aligned with the center line, which means we're going to need some amount of grabbing to correct for that crosswind. Okay, 200 feet, we bring our flaps up, which we weren't using for our crosswind takeoff anyway. And then we would continue our flight. All right, let's jump back to our lesson plan for today. Make sure there's nothing else to cover. Um, one I will point out, just because we're going to be doing a lot of practice at Palo Alto, I'll go and show what this 10 degree right turn off of 3-1 looks like, just so that um, just for the awareness on that. Couple common errors, ignoring the crosswind. Gotta make sure you're using your right crosswind, or your, sorry, not right, but your crosswind uh, deflection of the ailerons as you're taking off. Drifting from center line during the takeoff roll, drifting from center line during climb out. This is the big things you wanna be working on. Client must demonstrate for completion standards, client must demonstrate proficiency and safety for normal takeoffs and climbs, including pre-takeoff checks, traffic awareness, and emergency options. Required homework, I put it under required. If you were a student, I would put this as required. For anyone tuning into the live stream, of course, it's up to you. But read through the POH sections one, two, four, and five. So uh, one is sort of the general overview. Uh, two is all about limitations. Four is the normal procedures. Some of these will be beyond what we've talked about now, but getting a, an initial familiarity with them will be really good. Um, and then five is all the performance stuff. So we went through some of those performance things today, enough that you would be able to uh, at least see and understand sort of the basics of the other performance tables. Um, and we'll do more with those in future lessons, but it's good to start building that awareness now. And before you solo, you should have read through the whole POH anyway, because you want to make sure you understand the user manual for the airplane. Some recommended homework, a chair fly takeoff. So just practice those maneuvers, practice what it would mean to do a crosswind takeoff, and then rehearse the takeoff emergency plans. So that, you know, what if we don't develop enough power as we're actually on the taxi or on the runway? What if we don't have uh, engine power after takeoff of below pattern altitude, and then what about at pattern altitude? All right, last but not least, I said that I would go back and show 3-1 um, from Palo Alto. So more typically, we have wet wind coming from the north. So actually, something interesting with the storms going on is a lot of our wind is coming from the south right now. Usually, that's an indication of that weather. Okay. So we would do our takeoff on 3-1. Um, like normal, so we're aligned with the center line, we get to 51, we rotate up, start our climb out, like this, and as long as there's a chance that we're going to land on the runway, um, we'll, we'll keep with the center line. As soon as we get to the end of the runway, you'll notice that my heading right now is 3310, uh, three basically, with 309. Um, I want to be 10 degrees deflected to the right for noise abatement. So if you notice, right in front of us, there's that town. So to um, reduce air traffic noise for them, we deflect 10 degrees to the right over here, um, and then we fly that for the rest of this. So where I said you want to stay aligned with the center line, um, that is true for most airports. For noise abatement at Palo Alto, we deflect 10 degrees off. And the point that uh, instructors will mostly tell you to aim for is this little, um, uh, I think it's an electrical facility maybe, uh, is really clear from the ground. It doesn't show up as well in the sim, but there's kind of a lot of uh, buildings and things you can see there. And so we generally fly towards this. That's also right where the bridge is, where we use for our departures. So um, again, take off on 3-1 from Palo Alto. You're gonna fly runway heading until you reach the end of the runway. 
310, and then deflect 10 degrees to the moon, which essentially takes you to this structure. All right, that's all I got for today. Thank you everyone for joining. Thanks for the good questions. And uh, I will hopefully see you all. Was it Wednesday today? So I actually have a interview for a flight school tomorrow, so I won't be streaming tomorrow, but on uh, Friday I should be back, assuming no unexpected hiccups. Um, and so on Friday we'll jump into the next lesson, which is ground reference maneuvers. So hopefully you'll see you on Friday. Bye.